Y'all look good. You know, I was, uh, some of you know I was in Honduras this past week, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but you travel to a third world country and you come home and you're always grateful for this country. As messed up as it is, we're still blessed to live here, and, and there's no place like home. Your own bed, and if you understand traveling in a third world country, your own bathroom. You know what I'm saying? So it's good to be home. Uh, have you ever watched one of those shows on TV that's like a, a talent show, an audition type show, uh, American Idol, uh, The Voice, America's Got Talent? How many of you watched one of those kind of shows? Okay, I've, well, I've watched a handful. My favorite episodes are when, uh, you know, someone comes on stage and initially he or she uh, doesn't look super special. How do I say it? Just kind of unassuming at first. And then they do their thing. They, op- they, they sing or they act or they do whatever it is they do. And they just, wow. They blow the judges away. They blow the, the standing ovation. Maybe the best example of this is from Britain's Got Talent with this lady right here. Y'all remember her? That's Susan Boyle. And a handful of years ago, she walks on stage. And how do I say this kindly to Susan? She's kind of unassuming. All right? Who, you, know, is that, you know what I'm saying? All right. But then she sings, and wow, totally blows the judges away, standing ovation, and now she's this worldwide vocalist, lots of recording albums and all that, just blew the judges away. Well, about 1950 years ago, this guy walks on, if you will, center stage of the world. His name was Paul. And at first, he's kind of rather unassuming guy. From the, from the earliest pictures of antiquity that we have of him, he, he kind of looked like this. Uh, scrawny, long-faced, long-nosed, bald, <laughs> kind of unassuming, you know, not anything special to look at, <laughs> kind of familiar. And, but in his 30s, early 30s, he meets Jesus Christ, or it's probably better said that Christ met him on the road to Damascus, and his life was changed. And for the rest of his life, he lived, man, can I just say this? He blew the judge away by how he lived his life. And he finished well. And may I just say to everybody listening, it is my heart's desire, and I believe God's desire, that you finish this one life well. And here in this passage we're going to look at, Paul told us how, and I'd like to glean from that, all right? But before I show you, let's pray. So Lord, we invite you into our midst. We invite you to teach and to equip and encourage and correct us according to the truth of your Holy Scripture. We open our minds and our hearts up to you now. We believe this is your truth. This is your revelation. So make yourself known to us now as we spend time downloading and installing your heavenly truth revealed in your holy word. And we offer this prayer in agreement, in faith, and in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Find the book of 2 Timothy, however you get into God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you'd like to use the Bibles we provide for you, that's page 1190. Page 1190. You know, in this world that you and I live in, it is a... It's actually pretty easy to become famous for about 15 minutes. All you got to do is take a video of yourself doing something foolish or crazy or courageous or whatever, and it can go viral, right? And you can become worldwide famous overnight and get your 15 minutes of fame. However, I don't think that's really God's ambition for all of us, to pursue that 15 minutes of fame. I I think it's more like um, what Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. Really, if you will, success in the Christian life is achieved more by endurance and long-suffering and patience and tenacity and faith and and courage and stick-to-itiveness, my mom would call it. That's really the road to success in the Christian life. And beloved, the Apostle Paul had it. And how was he successful? How was he able to do that? He said so right here. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, 
who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Okay, in this passage, I see three essentials he revealed to his uh, successful finish. Three essentials to unashamed endurance. Essential number one, verse eight, suffering is inevitable, but strength is available. Listen, my beloved, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. This world hated me, it's probably gonna hate you. So listen, I'm going to make you a promise. If you follow after Christ hard enough, and if you live long enough in this world, you will experience two things, hard times and hardships. Welcome to Trinity Bible Church, all right? We love you, but we're also going to tell you the truth. Anyone anyone with some years behind them want to amen that? It's true. Hard Young people, hard times and hardships will come. God's not abandoning you when that happens. He promised that they would. Suffering is inevitable. So the issue is not when you're going to suffer, it's why you suffer. Here's what 1 Peter says. For what credit is it, uh, there is, when you sin, you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. You don't get credit for that. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God, a long obedience in the same direction. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So the issue is not will you suffer, it's why will you suffer? What are you suffering for? If you suffer because you messed up, you don't get any credit for that. But if you suffer because you're following Christ and you're doing good, will you get credit for that? Paul said, I want to, I'm not ashamed and I'm willing to suffer. He said explicitly, I'm suffering for one thing, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He just couldn't keep it to himself. He wanted the gospel to spread all over the world. And because he did that, y'all, this guy endured some hard times and some hardships. Check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's what Paul said about his life. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. They believed that 40 would kill you, so they gave him 39. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Young people, that means um, they threw stones at him. All right? Three. Three. Three times I was shipwrecked. Three times. It's like Paul's getting on. I think I'm getting off. All right? Uh, A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Hard times and hard... You want to follow after Christ? Welcome. Suffering... Isn't it, now, I pray that you don't suffer that much. Good heavens. But hard times and hardships will come if you follow Christ hard enough in this God-forsaken world. Suffering's inevitable. But, did you notice what he said? I'm willing to suffer for the gospel, end of verse 8, according to the power of God. Other translations say by the power of God or with the strength that God gives me. So the the key, beloved, to overcoming these hard times and hardships is the power of God, the power of God in me, the power of God for me, the power of God with me, the power of God through me. It takes power to overcome all this. This is what Paul said in Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And this this verse right here actually was our verse in Honduras that we were teaching to all the deaf kids. Now, you need to understand this. If you're a deaf kid in a third world country, your life is pretty much relegated to servitude or just to begging on the streets. Unless a church sends a missionary to you to teach you sign language that you can learn, that you are special. 
that God loves you and has a plan for your life. And that's what we've done in Honduras. And the verse that we were teaching the, the, the deaf in Honduras this past week is this one right here. So I learned this verse in Spanish sign language this week. And now you're going to learn it too. All right? So get your hands free. All right? Let's do this together. We're going to do some Spanish sign language. All right. In Spanish, the word for I is yo. Everybody say yo. yo. All right. So yo is like a hang loose, make a Y. That's Y. And then you bring it on your chest. That's I in sign language. Yo. Okay? Can is two fists putting it down like that. I can. Do is, is taking those fists and it's like doing work. All right? Doing some work. I can do. All, you take your hands and you rotate them around each other and s slap them on top of each other. That's it. I can do all things. A thing, a cos things in Spanish are cosas. So you take your C's and you do kind of like what you did with work. I can do, cos I can do all things. I through, and then you take that same C and like make the sash of a king. Christ the king. I can do all things through Christ. Who, then you reach up to heaven and receive. Who gives me strength. Pat your bicep. There you go. That was our message all week long. Let's do it one more time. Ready? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Beloved, I don't care what you're going through in life. I don't care what your hard times or hardships may be. You can do it. If you will just You can do it. You can do all things. Suffering is inevitable, but strength is available. That's essential number one, all right? Here's essential number two, verse nine. We are saved by his grace and called to his purpose. Paul said, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Beloved, we are not saved by our works. We're saved by his grace. Grace is God's loving initiative towards us. God giving us things when we don't deserve it. That's his grace. You know, and I'm not sure quite what happens to us. I've seen this a number of times where someone who's lived a sinful life gets rescued. To be saved means to be rescued. Gets rescued by God, by his grace, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And now they're saved. And then, then, like within a few weeks, they get on Facebook, and now all of a sudden they're like the righteousness police. You know what I'm saying? They get on there and they start pointing fingers at everybody, and you can't do that, and you can, you're a sinner, and you can't do that. And part of me is like, dude, three weeks ago, you were in that tribe over here. And the only reason you're not is because of God's grace. Nothing you've done. We're saved by grace. Our message is grace. That's what the Apostle Paul said. That's why he wanted to get the gospel out. I've been rescued by grace. Grace is my story. Grace is my song. All right? We're saved by grace. I love, uh, there's a missions leader named Paul Washer. I loved what he said. He said, I've given Christ countless reasons not to love me. None of them changed his mind. Mm. Y'all, that's grace. God loves you, and you can't change his mind. You have been saved by his grace. This is the heavenly part of the gospel, that you get to spend eternity with God. This is why I know Barbara Bush is now with the Lord. But before she passed away, she was asked about death. How do you feel about death? And here's what she said. She said, I know there is a great God, and I am not worried. You're saved by grace. That gives us the confidence and the security to know that we're going to spend eternity with him. But, my beloved, sometimes that's all churches preach about is you get to go to heaven when you die. There is so much more to Christianity than that. Did you notice? He said, not only has God saved us, he's also called us with a holy calling. Please observe. And at the top of verse 9, he didn't just say, God saved me and called me. He said, God saved us and called us. Y'all, that's the church. He's called us. If you are in the church, you have been called to a higher purpose with a holy calling. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. There's more to life than just being saved and going to heaven. I love how Ephesians 2 puts it. Uh, God, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's our salvation. That's by grace. That's going to heaven. But please notice right after that, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works 
which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Y'all, that's right now. The other half, if you will, of the gospel is that it matters now. Your life matters now. You weren't just saved by His grace. You were called to His purpose. God has good works for you to do. And this is an important message for me. Let me just say this. When God created you, it wasn't on accident. You're, it might have been an accident for your parents, but you were not created on accident. All right? God created you on purpose. Think. You are the only you in the history of the world. God made you on purpose. This is a really, if I can just share a little bit of my story with you, this is a, a really important message, I think. Because there was at one point in my life, I didn't know God. For the first 16 years of my life, I didn't have a relationship with God at all. And I knew that my life didn't have meaning and purpose in it. And I lived back in the day when you walked to school and back, okay? And so I walked home from school. My parents were at work. My brother's at football practice. I just quit football. And uh, I came home to my empty house and my empty room, and I sat on my carpet, and I got out my fishing knife, and I put it on my left wrist. I had watched enough TV to know how to kill myself. I was 12 years old. And I sat there. I wish I could say I was calling out to God, but I, like I said, I didn't really know God. I wasn't, I was just, I don't, I don't know, it's hard to say what I was doing. I was just trying to find a, mean, a, a reason to live, is what I was doing. I was trying to find meaning and purpose for my life. And the only thing I could come up with is I was costing my parents money. My life had no meaning or purpose in it. And my testimony is, life doesn't have meaning or purpose in it unless Christ is in it. But God created you on purpose. He saved you by his grace and he called you to his higher purpose. Your life matters. Everybody listen to me. You matter. God wouldn't have created you otherwise. Your life has meaning and purpose. God has called you up. He has good works for you. He's prepared good works for you to do. All you got to do is walk in them. You can make a difference in this world. Your life matters, all right? Paul knew his role. He said he was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. That was his role in the kingdom. May I ask you a question? What's yours? What has God called you to do? We're all different. We're all meant to do different things. You don't have to be like anybody else. You just got to be the first you. What has God called you to do? Where's your place? Well, last weekend, we had our mid-high retreat out at Sky Ranch in East Texas. And some brave adults spent the whole weekend with 65 fifth and sixth graders. All right? Now, they spend time with these fifth and sixth graders every week, but this was a special weekend out at Sky Ranch. And so after the retreat was over, we sat them down and asked them, what possesses an adult to want to spend the entire weekend with 65 fifth and sixth graders? And here's what they said. I think as Christians, um, it's always important to pour into the next generation. You know, as a believer, we're designed to serve first and foremost. And, um, you know, God has given us instruction in the Old Testament of Deuteronomy to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul. And in that, we need to share with our kids. Um, we need to pour into them while we're sleeping, while we're eating, while we're uh, walking down the street. Um, and not just our kids. I mean, Christ had a heart for children. And so the opportunity to serve um, is really just a blessing for, for, for the believer. Personally, I believe these kids are the next generation of our church. Um, and if I don't get involved, I'm going to let somebody else train my children up. And so I think it's very important for us to, to be involved and let the Lord lead us in the direction you know, as far as discipleship um, and, and how we pour into the church. I was thinking about this and talking with my own sixth grader. And uh, I think that today's kids are so busy. Our society is faster paced than any of us can keep up with it, with them. And so um, kids know that if something is important, if it's valuable, um, if it's real, then grownups spend time 
on that thing. And so uh, we as the church body, we can say we love kids. Kids are important. We can say we love Jesus. Jesus is important. We can say the church is so important. But when we show up, when we're there, they see us show up to spend time with them. Our most precious possession in our society is time. And if we spend that time and we're there, then suddenly you have kids go, hey, there's a real person. Maybe they really do love me because they believe it. They showed up. They're here. That person says, God loves me. Well, they're here. They love me. Maybe the God that they love really loves me too. It's not just words. So I think that's why it's so important that we take the time and the energy to show up and be with our kids and be the gloves on the hands of Jesus in their life. Not just say it, but live it. Because what we live is what we really believe. And our kids and our teens know that. They're not stupid. They're smart. <laughs> well, there's a quote that states that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And uh, I wanted to, to move beyond being a spectator on the sidelines to being a participant so that uh, we can build a legacy for our family and for our kids and uh, have a generational impact and influence over the years uh, that will far forgo me and be a legacy that would live on, uh, similar to compounding as an investment. Uh, you know, if I can put into other children and others and see that uh, grow and develop beyond what I can do individually, and then I don't see anything better uh, that could be for, for uh, our kids. I also wanted to be a good steward uh, with my time, treasure, and talents. And usually we spend most of it on time and treasures and little on talents. Uh, so I wanted to be able to expand on that and use the gifts that God's given me to help uh, further the, the growth of our children in our ministry. Somewhere there's a younger person praying for a mentor, so get ready you could be God's answer to that prayer. Those brave souls uh, have found their place investing in the next generation. They've answered God's call to his higher purpose. Where's yours? What's yours? Essential number one, suffering is inevitable, but strength is available. Essential number two, we are saved by grace and called to his purpose. All right? Here's essential number three. Last verse, verse 12. In the end, it's all about communion and conviction. You want to finish well, you need communion and conviction. Here's what he says, last verse. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. Why? For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul says, I know God. See, this is also Christianity, y'all. It's not just about studying and learning about God. It's about knowing God personally. It's about having a relationship with God where you can have communion with Him, fellowship with Him, talk to Him, download from Him, install things from Him, offer things up to Him, to have a relationship with God. This is why Christ came. He said this in John 17. He's praying to God the Father, and He says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. You see, that's Christianity. It's not just a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. That's a drag. That's the law. That's old covenant. That's done away with. This is new covenant. Now you have the Holy Spirit in you living inside of you. Now, just like Jesus said, just like with the wind, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is those who follow the Spirit. Now you get to follow the Spirit of God. Now you get to enjoy knowing God. That's Christianity through Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I know whom I have believed. And he said, I am convinced Others say persuaded, convicted, that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him. Conviction comes from repeated experiences of certainty, right? And to guard means to keep or to protect. I got to, to experience this once again coming back from a foreign country. You know, you come back to the United States and, and you encounter these border patrol agents. Now, my experience is we've kind of beefed up our border security uh, here recently, and, and, and years passed when I came through, and you see these custom agents. I look at them, and I mean, I'm like 6'2", 200. I'm like, I can take you. You know what I'm saying? If I had to. If I, had, I mean, I, I want to get back, and if you say no, I, I could take you. All right? But the Border Patrol agent that I had coming back from this trip, he's like this tall, probably outweighed me by a good 40 pounds, and was an ox. 
And I looked at him and I said, you're my kind of guard. You're, right? you're my kind of border patrol agent. I respect you. And fortunately, he, he let me in. Uh, but what makes a good guard? Someone who's strong, assertive, forceful, powerful, and well-resourced. That's God. My beloved, I say to you on the authority of God's word, he can guard whatever you entrust to him. Now, maybe he will only guard what you do entrust to him. A bank can only guard what you put in its safe deposit box. A storage unit can only guard what you put in it. A, you know, a security website can only guard the, the private information that you put in it. Then, like Facebook, they turn around and sell it. But that's another story, all right? But you know what I'm saying? God can only guard what you entrust to him. So may I ask you a personal question? What have you entrusted to God? What have you entrusted to God? Your finances? Your family? Your health? Your relationships? Your future? Your very soul? Beloved, whatever you entrust to him, have the conviction that he can guard it. That's how Paul finished well, all right? That's why Paul was able to say at the end of his life, at the, at the end of this book, actually, this is the last letter he ever wrote. The last chapter he said this in verse 6, the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Beloved, he finished well. Because he knew that while suffering was inevitable, strength was available. He finished well because uh, he had the, the, the conviction to know that he could entrust anything he needed to God. He finished well. And I know that's his desire for you. So, okay, I want to try something. As I was praying through this, God reminded me of a passage in Leviticus it's Leviticus 19.32. It says, To rise in the presence of the aged and show respect for the elderly and revere your God, I am the Lord. So I just want to say to all of you who are, if I can call you elderly, with all due respect, let's say you're in the fourth quarter of your life. God wants you to finish well. And may I say, on behalf of all those who are not in the fourth quarter of our lives, although I might be, it's really important to the church for you all to finish well. We need you to finish well. These young people need examples of people who are finishing well in the faith. And so here's what I want to do. That passage says to rise in the presence of the aged and respect you. So if you are in the fourth quarter of your life, so let's do some math. Let's say the average person passes away at 80. So let's say you're over 60. All right? Don't hate me. All right? But if, if you're over 60, please stay seated. If you're under 60, please stand up. Now here's what I want to do. All of us who are standing, I want us to give a standing ovation to all those who are seated. Let's do this right now, all right? Okay, elderly people, we need you. We need you to finish well. Suffering is inevitable, but strength is available. You can do this. You can do all things through Christ who gave you strength. You can do this. Maintain your communion. Maintain your conviction. Maintain your faith. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. You can do this. We need you to do this. Amen? Amen. All right. You may be seated.